Welcome back, everyone. Um, lecture number 64. This is kind of a general review. What I've done is I've randomly wrote a bunch of fill in the blanks just to uh, go over a couple of topics just off the top of my head. So um, hopefully you can fill in the blanks as I go along and I'll try to talk a bit about each topic, uh, see what we need. Okay. And in the subsequent lectures, I will, you know, we'll do some math, all right, some calculations, but let's just go over some word things, okay? All right, here we go. Again, this is not in any order, it's just whatever came to me, all right? The first law of thermodynamics is also known as whose law, do you remember? Okay, it's known as the law of Clausius, Clausius, can you see that, Clausius? Clausius's law is the same as the first law of thermodynamics, and it's simply a statement of what? Well, the first law of thermodynamics is a statement of conservation of energy. Conservation of energy. Okay, essentially it says if you add heat to a system, the heat energy has to go somewhere. So we know when you increase the temperature of a system, the average kinetic energy increases, okay? If there's constant volume, then that's all that happens is the particles move faster. However, if you allow your system to uh, not have constant volume, then as you heat it up, of course, work is done by moving the walls or increasing the volume. So you add energy, it can increase the internal energy or the kinetic energy of the system, and it can do work by moving walls, okay? So you put energy in, energy has to be used somehow. All right, law of Clausius, conservation of energy. So uh, continuing, while the second law deals with, uh, so that's the first law, uh, deals with uh, conservation of energy, while the second law deals with the increase of, if you remember, that's entropy. Remember, the universe is heading towards increasing entropy. All information will be lost, all planets will die, all stars will die, and this is called the heat death of the universe, okay? The law of entropy, which we say is a measure of disorder. Disorder. Entropy is a measure of disorder. Life, you and I, a cockroach, a uh, banana, anything that's alive is a very ordered system, right? Every instant your body's fighting off diseases, your heart is working, your brain, most of you, your brain is working, all right? Uh, so human or any type of life is a very organized system, but unfortunately we tend towards disorder. We're going to die and the bug's going to eat us and we're going to disintegrate and go back to the earth and then the earth will die, etc. So entropy, disorder, the natural thing. All right, two examples of an inverse square law. Remember what an inverse square law is. An inverse square law is something who has distance in the denominator with the square of it, so one over d squared, okay? So the two examples are Coulomb's law, Coulomb, okay? That's where you have the electric constant K times Q1, Q2 divided by the distance squared, okay? And then we have Newton's, I'm gonna write N, Newton's universal law of gravitation. N-U-L-G, Newton's universal law of gravitation, okay? And again, this is, you have the gravitational constant, big G in front of it, then you have M1, M2, once again, over the distance squared. So if I have two objects, there's a gravitational force of attraction. If I go twice as far away, the force is one-fourth as great. If I make D 2D, then when I square that, 2 squared is 4. Since it's in the denominator, it's 1 fourth is great. If I go 8 times farther apart, the force is 1 64th as great. If I go 3 times closer, where D is 1 third, 1 over 1 third squared is 1 over 1 ninth. 
the nine comes up. So if I go three times closer, the force is nine times greater. Okay, inverse square law. So Coulomb's law and uh, Newton's universal law of gravitation. A body's resistance to being moved. You try to push an object. Clearly, it depends on mass or the weight on Earth, but we call this the inertia. Okay, inertia. Remember, we said uh, electricity involves the flow of electrons. Why does it involve the flow of protons? Well, protons have a mass. They're in the nucleus. Uh, they're also with neutrons. So protons and neutrons have masses of about 2,000 times that of an electron. So again, if an electron is one pound, the proton or neutron is your car, 2,000 pounds. Okay, so if a force or electric uh, uh, potential is put on a system, it's the light things, the electrons that move. So electrons have much less inertia, so the electrons carry the current. Okay, not the protons, too heavy, too much inertia. Okie doke. The temperature which, at which all motion stops is absolute zero. Okay, so absolute zero is zero Kelvin. And zero Kelvin is the same as what? Minus 273 Celsius, degrees Celsius. I'm not converting to Fahrenheit. I'm not that smart right now. Okay, so all motion stops. If you're not at absolute zero, then every atom wiggles a little or moves a little, has some thermal energy, okay? Everything has some kinetic energy. At zero Kelvin or minus 273 Celsius, there is zero kinetic energy, no wiggling, no moving of an atom. And the third law of thermodynamics, you're not responsible for this, actually says it would take an infinite amount of time or an infinite number of steps to reach absolute zero. We can never reach absolute zero. That's essentially what the third law of thermodynamics states. Okay, uh, resistors in parallel, okay, resistors in parallel, remember, have the same potential difference. So I'm going to put V. Uh, I'll put potential, I'll put pot, not pot, pot, difference, D-I-F-F, -F, which is just capital V. Okay, so it's what we would call voltage, okay? Hopefully you can read all this nonsense, voltage or potential difference. While those in series, the resistors in series, remember series is one after the other, means in series, they all have the same current. Okay, call that I, right? So resistors in parallel, they have the same potential difference V, and resistors in series have the same current. Remember, when we do uh, R equivalent for series, we simply add up R1 plus R2 plus R3, and we can replace the resistors in series by just the sum. If we want to get the equivalent resistance for those in parallel, remember, it's the inverse. 1 over R equivalent is 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2 plus et cetera, et cetera. So it's just an exercise in fractions. Okay? Great. Another name for an H plus ion. This is a little tricky. I'm so tricky. H plus ion. You know what that is? H plus ion. So an H plus ion is simply an hydrogen atom taking away an electron. Well, what's a hydrogen atom? Hydrogen atom is a proton and electron. If you take away the electron, an H plus ion is simply a proton. A proton. It's good. Well, the name of, I wrote an X with a one down here and a two here. So it has one proton and two nucleons. One proton, remember, if you have one proton, by definition, you are hydrogen or an isotope of hydrogen, right? What makes an element an element is the number of protons. If you have 92 protons, you are uranium, okay? If you have six protons in your nucleus, you are carbon and so forth. So this element, this isotope, whatever it is, has one proton, so it's definitely hydrogen, but it has two nucleons. What does that mean? It has one proton, one neutron. So that's an isotope of hydrogen, and we said this was deuterium, or the deuteron, okay? Deuterium. Okie doke. 
And once again, we have, I wrote an X here, with one proton, three nucleons. Again, one proton, you're an isotope of hydrogen. Three nucleons means you have one proton and two neutrons, subtract three minus one. So this, we said, we call this isotope of hydrogen tritium. Tritium is actually radioactive. Deuterium is not. Deuterium, if I write that as a D, then water, heavy water is D2O, would be made with deuterium instead of hydrogen. Okay, it turns out that's very useful for nuclear reactors, um, but it's not important why. All right, let's keep going. Another name for a helium-4 nucleus, okay, come on, that's easy. Helium-4 nucleus is alpha particle. Remember, alpha has two protons and two neutrons. So the charge of an alpha particle is plus two. It has two protons, two neutrons, a mass of four in atomic mass units. So if element 80 loses an alpha particle, you subtract two protons, it becomes element 78, okay? If element 40 loses three, three alpha particles, then you've lost six protons, then instead of element 40, you're element 34 because you lost six protons. Okie dokie. The rate of change, this implies change in time, of displacement is called, okay? We call that, now if we're doing vectors, we call it velocity. Or we call it speed if we're not talking about vectors. We'll get back to that. While the rate of change of velocity, remember if the velocity changes, we said we have acceleration or deceleration. Okay, so the rate of change of velocity is a vector because acceler velocity is a vector, is acceleration, which is also a vector. Okay, remember, if an object falls, its speed increases by how much? By 10 meters per second every second. We're taking the acceleration due to gravity g to be 10 meters per second every second. So as an object falls every second, the speed increases by 10 meters per second every second. However, SpaceX, when you shoot something up in the air, what happens is gravity wants to slow it down by 10 meters per second every second, okay? An object moving horizontally can have any acceleration when you step on the gas or the, the brakes on your car or bicycle, okay? But up and down, the acceleration due to gravity is positive plus or minus 9.8 meters per second squared or 10 meters per second squared for us. Okie doke, the magnitude of velocity is called, well, remember, a vector has magnitude and direction. A scalar just has magnitude. The scalar part of velocity, or the magnitude of velocity, is just what we call speed, the speed of an object. In everyday life, we always interchange the words velocity and speed, but in physics, we have to be careful, right? A car, an airplane moving at 500 miles per hour, or we could say that's the speed. A car, uh, uh, an airplane moving at 500 miles per hour in a uh, northwesterly direction, that's the velocity. And of course, if you have many planes in the air, just knowing the velocity is not good enough. You'd better know the direction. So you put in the computer that you'll know that in 40 minutes, these two things can collide. So velocity is a vector. Good. All vectors have both. Well, what did we just say? We have a, a magnitude, I'll put mag, because I can't fit it, and direction. Magnitude and direction, all vectors. So a ball moving at, or a train moving at 50 miles an hour, I'm telling you the speed of the train. A train moving at 50 miles an hour with due north, I am telling you the velocity, okay? Very, very simple. Okie doke. The fuel, I told you this was completely random. The fuel created in the nuclear breeder reactor. Now again, let's go back. Remember, nuclear fission is the splitting of an atom. The fuel we use is uranium. 
when we take uranium out of the ground, right? It's just a resource, it's just a rock. So remember, any resource on the earth is finite. It will run out, okay? So this uranium will run out as a fuel. We said that 99.3% of this uranium is the isotope U-238. Uranium-238 does not fission, okay? So when we shoot a neutron at it, it does not split up. The 0.7% of the uranium found naturally in the ground, the U-235 isotope, does fission. So if we're going to use nuclear power, nuclear fission, we're only using less than 1% of this very finite resource. And so if we want it to last, we better figure out a way of using the uranium-238. Now, I just said U-238 does not fission. However, there's a process where you can add a neutron to uranium-238, and it goes through a couple of beta decays, goes through thorium and whatever, and eventually it ends up at plutonium-239. Plutonium-239 is gotten by adding a neutron to uranium-238, and it changes to, to plutonium-239. All of the plutonium on the Earth is man-made, human-made, because the original plutonium uh, at the creation of the Earth four billion years ago or so uh, has dissipated, has changed, is radioactive and changed into other things. I believe plutonium has a half-life of about 25,000 years. So in 100,000 years, it would undergo four decays, one over two to the fourth, right, is uh, one sixteenth as much. In 200 years, forget it, there, there's even less. And so if you go millions of years, there's you can see that the amount of plutonium on the Earth is none. It's exponentially decayed to nothing, okay? So the reactor, the breeder reactor fuel is plutonium. I'll write P, U, 2, three, nine, okay? That's the fuel breeded, okay? Uh, the fissioning of a nucleus is initiated. What starts a nucleus from fissioning? The U-238, uh, U-235 nucleus. Why does it fission? Because you inject a neutron. Remember what I told you about reactors. Fission reactors, neutrons come in, the nucleus splits, more neutrons come out. Hopefully they hit other uraniums or plutoniums, whatever the fuel is. They split more neutrons. Now you have a, re a core made of some alloy like zircaloy. Um, what happens is as the neutrons come out, the neutrons hit the metal core. And what happens then is that that metal becomes radioactive. Um, what happens to the air is it becomes radioactive. Remember, air is mostly nitrogen and oxygen, which is fine, but it's nitrogen 14, oxygen 16. If they absorb neutrons, you can get uh, nitrogen 15 or 16, oxygen 17, 18, whatever, and those things then would become radioactive. So the air becomes radioactive. There is water surrounding the core to carry off the heat. When you hit neutrons into the water, the oxygen, again, in the water becomes radioactive. The uh, hydrogen can become deuterium, tritium, so forth. The water becomes radioactive. The air becomes radioactive. The core becomes radioactive. The fission products, when it breaks up uh, uh, into barium and krypton, those fission products absorb neutrons. They become radioactive. Then you have control rods made, made of uh, cadmium and boron. Those things then are absorbing neutrons, so they become radioactive isotopes of themselves. So everything inside the reactor becomes radioactive, um, and eventually you have to dispose of this radioactive waste. Uh, Staten Island's an idea, but no good. So they put it in a truck marked Twinkies, and they drive the uh, radioactive waste out to Nevada and bury it deep under a mountain, and they pray that nothing will happen. Okay? Not... Nice stuff. Uh, 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 okay, as the mass of an object is doubled, what happened to the density? Well, if I have a piece of lead this big and I have a piece of lead this big, what has a greater density? The answer is they have the same density, okay? Lead has the same density. Remember, density is the ratio of mass over volume. If you double the mass, you're also doubling the volume. So the ratio of mass over volume stays the same. So uh, as the mass of an object is doubled, its density 
does not change, does not change, okay? I can't read everything's so crooked here, right? Uh, blank waves may not be polarized. Well, remember what polarization is. Polarization is if a wave is coming towards you, the disturbance is perpendicular. Okay, this is a wave moving this way. The disturbance, the wiggling is perpendicular to that. So if I wave comes towards you, if I put a slit, then boom, that thing gets wiped out. That's polarization. Well, transverse waves wiggle. The disturbance is perpendicular to the direction of motion. Longitudinal waves, like in a spring, or sound waves, uh, the disturbance or oscillations are in the direction of motion. So if my spring's going this way, it wiggles this way. By putting a slit, uh, no polarization, right? Because it's not wiggling perpendicular. Okay, so blank waves may not be polarized. I want longitudinal. Longitude. I'm just going to put longit period. Okay, longitudinal. And an example of a longitudinal wave is, of course, sound, sound waves. Okay. When the solvent of a mixture is alcohol, we could all use that, right? Uh, the solution is called. Do you remember this? A tincture. 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 Right, the usual solvent, the most prevalent solvent is of course blank. What is it? It's water. And remember, water is a polar molecule. And then when we talk about solubility, like dissolves like. So if something dissolves in water, then that something, that substance is polar because water is a polar molecule. If you put oil in water, it does not mix immiscible so if oil does not mix in water and we know water is a polar molecule we conclude that oil is a non-polar molecule in general most organic things are non-polar some things have polar parts but it's really complicated and beyond this okay finally in the body your body not mine in, in the body enzymes behave as catalysts right catalysts everybody knows that Right. There's really two types of catalysts, right? There's inhibitors that slow down reactions and uh, the catalysts that speed them up. You know, you can say a, a negative catalyst if you want. But really, a catalyst is something that affects, affects the rate of reaction uh, of, of uh, a, a, a rea well, the rate of a reaction without itself being affected. OK. All right, there's semantics about whether you should say catalyst slows it down or only speeds it up and, and just use the word inhibitor. But uh, I like to say a catalyst just changes the reaction, the rate of reaction. OK, so it can go plus or minus. But when it's minus, it's also called an inhibitor. OK, all right. This is just a couple of things just going over uh, in the next lectures. We'll do some math and some more review. OK, we covered a lot of topics during the semester and uh, I just want to you know, review and, uh, you know, get everybody ready for the final exam. All right. See you next one. Take care of yourself. Be safe. Peace.